good as they can sing, it'll be a good day. Thank you all always for that. Thank you. I looked online, and last year I uh, did my uh, favorite Easter sermon. Being a professor type, I love to give evidences why we believe this or that is true. But I've become uh, convinced that it's not just evidence that the world needs to hear. I'm not sure what small percentage of people are convinced about the reality of the Christian faith based on evidence. What I think happens is that uh, God gives, um, how should we call it, an aha moment. When suddenly things that were fuzzy become clear and things that were untrue become real. I want to talk a little bit about that today. If you, if you want to see those evidences for the resurrection, they're out of 1 Corinthians 15. They're online, and I hope you will look at those. I was thinking today how much my own theology and life has been influenced by one simple text. All of you know it well. It's hard for us to quote a text today because we have so many translations, but I think you know this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Now, I believe that with all my heart. That is a... It is a wonderful text about the character of God, the need of man, God's provision in Christ, and the hope for whosoever will. What a marvelous text. I do believe that the disciples, although they were still very Jewish, although they still had Jewish expectations, believed in Jesus. They were willing to leave everything they had and follow him. But even though they believed, even though they saw the miraculous deeds that he did, I mean from raising the dead and uh, healing lepers and just the panoply of Jesus' miraculous love gifts to show the heart of God, even being there at every one of his teaching sessions, they just didn't get it. Now, I'm amazed about that. Now, I want to work through that a little. And I'm, I'm always a little nervous. Um, I'm, I, I want to be an exegetical preacher, which means I usually try to go to a text and open that text up from its context, its grammatical features, its word studies. But uh, for this one, I'm going to have to get you to turn with me in your Bibles. Now, if you didn't bring your Bibles, it's on. I think the battery's down. So j let me use this one, okay? Demons live in sound systems, and they come out on Easter. So you can hear me, right? And by the way, I meant to say it when I got up here. Thank you, thank you for coming today and worshiping with us. I guess when I finish, what I'm going to say is, I don't believe that this is a special Sunday. I like the flowers, but it's not a special Sunday. I like the banners, but once you get it, my friend, every day is Resurrection Day. <laughs> it changed. I like that song. I've just seen Jesus, and nothing can ever be the same again. Now, that's what I'm going to try to do to you. Because that aha moment has got to happen to American Christianity. I think there's some analogous relationships between the disciples loving him, worshiping him, trusting him, but. And it's the but that surprises me. I guess when I look at these resurrection passages, and there are, there are numerous ones, you say to yourself, how could the disciples have the lower doors locked and the upper doors locked, and even when the women told him, he is risen, and they went, ah, get over it. <laughs> they were totally surprised by the resurrection. I can't. Hello, Peter, James, John, what is the matter with you? I mean, it's not like Jesus hadn't told them about five times, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer and die, I'm going to raise on the third day, I'll meet you at a mountain in Galilee. And they, what they did, every time they said, who's greatest among us? Can we sit on your right hand and left? 
Holy moly. Every time he told them, every time they start discussing who's greatest. The Jewish leaders, not only the, not only the Sanhedrin, which was made up, of course, of Sadducees and Pharisees, they believe he said he's going to come out of the grave. We got to go lock the tomb. We got to put a guard on the tomb. He claimed he's coming out. And the 12 are going, what are we going to eat tonight? <laughs> what has happened to these men? I think it's what happens to us. They'd been around Jesus. They'd seen some wonderful things, and somehow it all became common. And now he's dead, and every promise they forgot. And they just went back to their normal life. Peter went back to fishing. They just went back. They just said, well, it's over now. You just wonder to yourself what happened. So I, the Old Testament professor in me said, didn't they have scriptural evidence for the promise of a resurrection and a new day? Wasn't there scriptural prophetic indicators pointing that what Jesus said about I'm going to die and come out of the grave that's nothing new matter of fact he alludes to that several times I'll give you a sign no sign Jonah three days that, that's that's kind of a oblique sign but there's some other more powerful ones I want to run through these texts just briefly many of these you will know I'd like for you to turn if you can do it um, quickly enough now, this is not a test. You don't get a bicycle if you do it. But, you know, by the way, it looks so much better if the gold on your Bible is worn off. I tell new preachers, buy a new Bible, put it in the dryer for 15 minutes. It makes you look so much more spiritual. <laughs> don't, let, don't go around with a brand new gold leaf Bible. That's not good. Uh, let's go first to the book of Proverbs, I'm excuse me, the book of Job. And as you know, Job, historically, contextually, Job is the same time period as Abraham. Now exactly this book was written later, but the, the experience of Job is much earlier. And of course there are two very famous texts in Job. The first is in Job 14 and verse 14. Famous question. I know once I start reading it you'll recognize it immediately. Job says, in the midst of all of his dialogues with his friends, if a man dies Will he live again? All the days of my struggle I will wait until my change comes. God will call and I will answer him. Now, that's a pretty powerful text. Here is a, here is a patriarch um, asking the question about shall we live after death and then expressing his faith that God and him will have a conversation. Turn over to Job 19 just for a minute, where another one of these very famous Old Testament resurrection uh, precursors is revealed. Job 19, 25. Now you, I'm going to read a couple of verses. You'll recognize this immediately. And as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my flesh is filleted, yet without my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, whom my eyes shall see, and not another. My heart faints within me. Oh my goodness. Now, here's a man who is saying basically, God as Savior is going to be intimate with me after I die. And this man's convinced of that. Now, there are several texts in the Psalms. I'm, I'm just going to pick one psalm to kind of give you the flavor of this. And the rest of them are pretty much like this. And that would be Psalm 16, verse 10. Now, these are messianic because they're used by New Testament people, I think, including Jesus, to talk about himself. And there are several. I'll tell you the other ones, but this is the one I'm going to read. For thou wilt not abandon my soul to Sheol, neither wilt thou allow thy Holy One to see the pit. Thou wilt make known to me the path of life. In thy presence is the fullness of joy. At, that right, at thy right hand there are pleasures forever. Now this is a promise 
a, a messianic promise. If you have your pencils, I hope you write down two more you could check later as a maybe de a Bible uh, devotion tonight. We're not having church tonight. This would be a wonderful thing to read with your family and discuss. And that would be Psalm 4915. And of course, the mo very famous one, Psalm 8613. Now, from there, I want to go to the major prophets for a minute. This is not the only evidence for the promise of, a, we could say, a resurrection or life after death or a new age coming with intimacy to God so different from this one. And I would like to go to Isaiah. And the, one I, the reason I like this so much is because these are the texts that begin to include the nations, that the world is on the heart of God. That John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, there really is an eternal, redemptive plan covering all human beings made in the image and likeness of God. So if you will go, the first one is Isaiah 25, Isaiah 25, verse 6 through 8. Now, I've said to you that I think that God has to open our eyes. So there is an allusion here to God removing the veil from the Gentiles. Now, look at this beautiful text. We might even call this a messianic banquet text. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all the peoples on this mountain. A banquet of aged wine. Obviously, these were not bandits. <clears throat> Choice pieces of marrow, refined aged wine. And on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering which is over all the peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all the nations. He will swallow up death for all time. The Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces and will remove the approach of his people from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. And it will be said on that day. And then it continues. And turn over one page to Psalm 26, 19. Again, another, another reference to resurrection. And the dead will live. Their corpses will rise. Who, live, who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. For your dew is as the dew of a new dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. Now, that's just pretty plain, pretty clear. The next one I want to look at, there's a couple more if you want to tonight read 42 and 49. That's where the nations again are brought in, that all the nations are included in these end time events. I would look just a minute, I, I'm not going to read it, but you might want to make note of it. Do you remember the Valley of Dry Bones? Remember that psalm you used to sing, the hip bones connected to the... Well, that, that is an allusion to Ezekiel 37, where the prophet is to speak over a valley of bones. Now, many theologians say this is a corporate resurrection of Israel, and that is certainly true. But it is a, a passage that speaks about life from death. On a corporate scale, I would certainly agree. We've looked at individual texts, we've looked at corporate texts, and then we have that one in Ezekiel 37. But the one I want to touch on, just keep turning through with me, is to Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. Now, Daniel 12 is maybe one of the, well, it might be the only Old Testament text where not only is a resurrection mentioned, but a resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous. So if you look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, just for a minute, Daniel 12:2. And this, of course, is the culmination of the, of the vision of Daniel. And many of those who sleep, remember we talked about it theologically, the word many in the Bible is synonymous with the word all. If you have time after the service, I think I can show that to you if you're interested. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Now, why is it with all of this prophetic information, why is it with Jesus' statement to these men, did they not get it? <laughs> now, I've listed here, and again, I, I fret a little bit about, y'all just aren't used to lecture types. You're used to, and the little dog ran in the street. <laughs> Poems, deathbed stories, and three points. Get over it. I want to give you the text where every time Jesus said to these men, 
I'm going to Jerusalem to die, to suffer, to be turned over to the Gentiles. I, I'm going to be crucified, and I'm going to raise in three days. And they went, oh, that's, that's real nice. Here they are. I want you to write them down. I'm going to take the Gospel of Mark, earliest gospel probably. I want to give you three of them. Then I'm going to come back and read when it says they didn't understand. Mark 8, 31. Mark 9, 30 and 31. Mark 10, 33 and 34. Now, men, there are 12 of you. Now, one of them's a devil. One of them's going to bail out in the middle of the Lord's Supper. But the rest of them have left family and friends. Jesus empowered them to go out and cast out demons, heal sickness. These men had experienced his power, seen his power. And somehow, like Paul on the road to Damascus, there was some kind of blindness involved. Remember when Paul is healed, Acts 9, it said like flakes fell from his eyes. There are, there are blinders on these believing, dis called disciples. Let me just look at, a, look at a few of them. Would you turn with me to uh, Mark 8, 32? Oh, I left out one of my really good Old Testament ones. Before you go to Mark 8, I'm just going to read Hosea 13, 14. Listen to this. If you're getting older and worried about the funeral home, listen to this. Hosea 13, 14. I will ransom them from the power of Sheol. I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, where is your thorns? O oh, Sheol, where is your sting? Compassions will not be hid from my sight. Friends, <laughs> this is what Paul quotes in what? 1 Corinthians 15. O oh, death, where is your sting? It, the evidence is here. If they would have seen it, it's here. 8.32 and he was, he was um, starting the matter plainly, but Peter took him aside to rebuke him. Jesus told them clearly who it was, and Peter, as the spokesman for the group, said, Oh, Lord, now that's not going to happen to you. Let's talk about this. this. This can't be right. They just didn't get it. Turn over one, one passage. Mark 9, 32. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. Turn over chapter 10, verse 35 to 37. And James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do something for us, whatever we ask you. Oh, man. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said, Grant that we may sit in your glory on your right and on your left. Okay. This is the inner circle? One of them says, Lord, let me take you aside and explain better to you what you ought to do. And here are the two other inner circles. They want to get the first choice in to ask Jesus if they can be number one and number two. And when the other disciples heard it, they were appalled that they didn't get to ask first. Boy, Jesus picked some real ringers. There's some real ringers in this building. Because the truth is all God's got is ringers. And what's the, what's the problem with ringers? They don't get it. And American Christianity doesn't get it. We flood churches on Easter, and the world goes to hell 364 other days. We don't get it. I want to mention a couple of more texts, if I could. It looks to me like that a spiritual event has to occur. Now, I believe there is a spiritual event at salvation. That spiritual event seems to be connected with, oh my, I have done terrible things. Uh, I, God is upset with me. Uh, I believe there is a God. I believe there is justice. I believe there is a judgment day. And usually in most people's experience, salvation occurs through fear. There is fear. There is judgment. We hear a, the good news about love and Easter, and people say, oh, I want that. And we, we pray or, or trust or believe in Jesus Christ. It, it, I, I think it's so wonderful. But... These disciples had already done that. These were believers. These were men who should have known. I mean, they, they, these guys had the best knowledge about who is Jesus. They had seen it. They had heard it. 
they had been interpreted to privately and they're still expecting a Jewish kingdom and they still want to be number one and number two. It sounds to me like health, wealth, prosperity of an ancient variety. Now in John, if you'll turn me to John chapter 12, John 12 and verse 16. John 12, 16. John 12, 16. These things his disciples did not understand at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. Now just think about that. Jesus would do things and he would say to the disciples, you do not understand what I am doing now. One day you will understand. Now, I thought about that. You don't understand this now, but one day you will. I've often thought, where did the early church find the suffering servant or suffering Messiah text? A couple of more, couple of more turns. Would you go back to Luke 24 with me? This, of course, is uh, the two on the road to Emmaus. Uh, the, Jesus has been killed. Everything is over. These folks are just going home. Now look at look in verse Luke 24, 16. This is amazing text. Their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Jesus walked up to these two. We don't know if it's a man and a woman or two men. We don't know. He walked up to them and he said, what are you all talking about? They said, all right, what's the matter with you? Haven't you heard what happened in Jerusalem? That they've killed the, the, the prophet from Nazareth? Where have you been? Haven't you heard? Jesus walked for hours with them, talking to them. Then suddenly at night, he, Jesus was going to pass on. They said, no, let, eat with us. Please eat with us. And when Jesus prayed, look down a little bit at verse 31. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Their eyes were opened. You know, as an evangelical preacher, when I get an opportunity on a, on a holiday, a special day, quote, for the church, I long in my heart to say there's more, so much more to Christianity than the American church apparently has experienced. There's just so much more than, than the peripheral Christianity so characteristic of our culture. And, you, and it's not that you deny that people have trusted him. It's not that you deny that people don't worship him. It's not that, it's not that you deny that they've had an encounter with him. Oh, I, I would never doubt that. But when they've had an encounter and they continue to live their own lives for their own interest, spending all of their money on themselves, all of their time on what they want to do, and kind of throwing Jesus the what's left over of their lives, you just want to scream, don't you get it? Don't you get it? And I'm afraid that the church does not get it. I don't want to make a hard and fast theology here. I'm not trying to make a doctrine. <laughs> but I do believe there is often a two-step commitment experience, maybe a lordship experience. And that two-step, sometimes more than that is, yes, I'm not afraid to go to hell anymore. Yes, I pray when I eat. Yes, if, if, if my kids are sick, I pray for my kids. Yes. I'm going to put a bumper sticker on my car. Yes, I am going to go to... But friends, that, that's just not what it's about. That is so peripheral. That is so cultural. And it's so typical of Western Christians. It's a peripheral experience of religiosity instead of an intimate, dynamic 24-7, life-altering, life-changing, can't get over. The boy is out of the tomb, and it can't ever be the same. And it's not all about me. And nothing I have belongs to me. I am a called, gifted minister of Jesus Christ, 
because I'm a Christian. And the church doesn't get it. There's got to be another opening of these spiritual eyes. I don't know how it happens, but I pray for it. I pray that somehow those who already know him, those who already believe in an empty tomb, those who already know that heaven is their home, those who already have experienced something of the age to come, if I could just shake them and say, don't you realize that as you live every day are eternal opportunities that will never come again? Don't you realize the world is watching you to see if there's any qualitative difference in the way you do life? When are eyes going to be open? I like hymns, as you know, Skylar, and I, as I was writing these few notes, the one that kept coming to me, and maybe y'all can sing it with me because I don't want to hurt you. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hand the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Could that be our prayer on this Easter? Easter is not a doctrine. <laughs> Easter is a call to life. Easter life. Not a special Sunday a year when we buy Easter lilies. It's every Tuesday and every Friday night and every Saturday morning. Resurrection life flows through this place. And what we wanted to do is flow through this place with power to family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, co-students. How do we get these marvelous, beautiful banners out of our church and onto our lives? Because sermons are lived, not spoken. And Christianity is daily, not weekly. And if these men who saw Jesus raise the dead and got the private interpretation of the parables, if these men didn't get it until their eyes were opened, supernaturally opened after the resurrection, I think our prayer ought to be, Lord, if there's something blind in me, if, if there's something that uh, 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 keeping me from fully understanding my place, my purpose, your will, if you just clear that fog, this will be an Easter to remember. But the truth is, the vast majority of churches don't want any of their leaders to disrupt their normal, daily, self-centered, all-for-me life. They don't want to search for their own spiritual gift. They don't want to search for what God's calling them to do. I don't know what has to happen for America to have her spiritual eyes open, but I say this to you, whatever it takes, I pray it would come. Because it looks like to me, in the history of humankind, health, wealth, prosperity, and abundance have blinded the spiritual eyes even more of the people who already know him. Could you bow your heads with me, please? I just want to say to you again, thank you, thank you for choosing to worship with us. Thank you. But the chances are, if you worship him, he just might speak to your heart. He just might send his spirit. There just might be an aha moment. We are not saying, come here, be like us, but we are saying, Something really, really new has happened. Something really, really different.
The great fear of mankind has been dealt with. We can have restored intimacy with God. We pray that the reality of our music, of our text, would be speaking a word to your heart. Holy Spirit, please have freedom. We thank you that you've revealed yourself completely in your Son. We thank your Son would be willing to become one of us and remain one of us through eternity. We're thankful that though he was sinless, yet he died in our place. And we thank you that death and hell and tombs and rocks could not hold him in the ground. And we thank you that he's coming back one day to receive us unto himself, that where he is, there we may be also. But Lord, while you've left us here, as we meet people in the stores and on the street, and as we meet people, we want to give them the same joy and peace that we've experienced. We don't want them to be just like us. We're not asking for that. We know that we're all broken vessels, but we want them to know you. We, we want them to know you. We pray, Lord, if anyone's here who doesn't know you, that today they will trust you. We pray here for all, all that are here and have certainly opened their heart to you in salvation, that somehow the eyes of their heart will be opened and they would see this awesome responsibility that comes with eternal life, this awesome opportunity to pass on this wonderful joy to others. Lord, please, please let this not be just another Easter. Open our eyes, O oh Lord. Have mercy on us, even your children. We just don't get it, but we want to. We want to. Lord, we want to. Amen. We feel like, as an evangelical church, that the center of our worship time is a pulpit because we believe that the power is not in the preached word, but in the word, the word of God. The promises come from him. This preacher, that preacher may spin it this way or that, but the power is in the words. If you have heard that still, small voice of the Spirit of God, because the Bible says very carefully that no one can come to him unless the Holy Spirit draws them. John 6, 44, 65. And what I'm saying to you again is even as a Christian, maybe it wouldn't be a half bad prayer for those of us who've been in the church for decades to say, Oh Lord, open my eyes. What do you want from me? How can I be what you want me to be? Now we're going to give you a chance to respond because we feel God bound to do it. We're, we're, we're not here to manipulate you in any way, but we are here to say, if you felt that still small voice speaking to you, uh, the people on staff know their Bible. They would love to show you this. We're not going to ask you to join or do any religious act. We're just saying to you, if this moment the grace of God has touched you in, in fear, in wonder, in commitment, in need to repent, if you would like to join with us to reach this community, whatever God has said to your heart as we stand together, we invite you to respond, not to us, but to him as we stand together.